All right, everybody. Hi, thank you for joining us for this webinar on practical strategies for you pick farms and on farm produce sales during COVID-19. My name is Annie Clyde. I'm one of the statewide extension educators at University of Minnesota that focuses on fruit and vegetable production, along with my colleagues Annalisa Holtberg and Natalie Hoytel. Uh, Valerie Gamble from MDA is also joining us today, as well as Ryan Femling from Afton Apple Orchard. So we're going to go ahead and get started since we have a lot of content today. Uh, the first thing I want to do is hear where you're from. Um, I want to know how many people are calling in from Minnesota versus outside of Minnesota. So if you could just answer those poll questions real quick. So we've got about half and half. Half of our listeners today are from Minnesota and half outside of Minnesota. So thank you everybody for joining us. All right. The agenda today, first we're gonna talk about COVID-19 and what we're dealing with. I know that everybody's been bombarded with a lot of information about what COVID-19 is. Um, so this, there will be new information in this so, though, so make sure that you tune into this first section. Uh, and the second uh, section we'll talk about is strategies to reduce COVID risk on your UPIC farm or for your on-farm sales. Third, we will talk to Ryan at Afton Apple Orchard about what strategies and plans they're gonna be implementing on their farm to deal with COVID and stay open and successful this season. And then we're gonna to try to save plenty of time for question and answer at the end. And I also wanna note that uh, we can stay afterwards, at least me, Natalie, and Annalisa have decided that we, we don't mind staying afterward if people still have additional questions once our hour is done. All right, so I'm gonna um, open this to Val first. If Val wants to unmute herself. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, thanks. So just kind of to set the stage a little bit with this, um, as with most of our spaces that the Department of Agriculture normally regulates, um, there are no specific regulations that pertain to actually any food businesses specifically related to COVID-19. So UPIC operations as well um, do not have specific regulations in law, statute, rule um, that are specifically related to COVID-19. That being said, normal food safety requirements still apply. Um, so normal considerations, whether you're uh, under the produce safety rule as a covered farm fully or um, just following other good agricultural practices, all of that still applies the same way that it always would. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to share is that the MDA does have a COVID-19 guidance document that is specific for UPIC operations and on-farm sales. And the link is there on the website, um, on the slide here. So that one is available. Um, just one note with that too, it's being translated into Hmong and Spanish. So that should be up on our website as well within the next few days, I think. A few days to a week, that'll be, that'll be up and ready. So there's a screenshot of the guidance for Minnesota UPIC operations and on-farm markets. And then kind of uh, in tandem with that, or as a companion piece, we've got the COVID-19 response plan template for fruit and vegetable farms, which um, Annalisa and Natalie uh, drafted at the University of Minnesota. So that is available as well to help people kind of look at their operation and think about ways to reduce risk specifically related to COVID-19. All right, thank you, Val. I appreciate that. All right, Annalisa, you're up. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Annie, my name is Annalise Saltberg, and I'm an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. I've worked with a number of you in the past. I work with fruit and vegetable farmers around on-farm food safety, good agricultural practices, the FISBA produce safety rule. I've been at the university since 2011 in this role. So um, farmers have been working for years to reduce the chances that someone can get sick from eating their produce. COVID-19 is a little bit different, but somewhat the same. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes here doing an overview of what we know about the science of the virus, uh, transmission via surfaces and other um, 
things around the farm and then with the hopes that that can kind of help you prioritize your actions. I know that this is an extremely busy time for you and you only have so much time and money to dedicate to um, thinking about COVID. So hopefully today you can kind of help to prioritize some of those things. Knowing that going forward, you'll probably have to learn more. I hope that you turn to trusted sources like the CDC, FDA, Department of Health and Ag and Extension for that information. Also, we should say that what we're going to discuss today is current as of May 20th, 2020, but that this is changing rapidly. It is a respiratory disease. It's different than other foodborne illnesses that you might have thought um, about previously on your farm, like E. coli or salmonella. This is respiratory in nature. It's in our nose and our throats and our lungs. It is a novel strain of the coronavirus, so people don't have any natural immunities. We don't have any vaccines or therapies to treat it currently. We're working on that. We also have no evidence that suggests that anyone has ever been sickened with COVID-19 by eating food or touching the food packaging. That's not to say that it has never happened, but in general, this is not a foodborne illness at all. This is something, this is respiratory, much more like influenza that travels in via droplets in the air. So next slide, please. So this is a graphic. On the left, you see our person, a red person, and that person is an infected person. So when he breathes or speaks or sneezes or coughs, droplets, mucus, saliva is exhaled from him, and in those droplets can be viral particles of um, that have an infectious viral particle in it. So that can make this other person sick when it lands on or near them. That's the majority of illnesses. That's how people believe people are getting sick, from being in close proximity to one another. Thus, social distancing, physical distancing is really important. Then you have these fomites, which are just the surface. It's something that can convey that bit of viral particle from one person to another. It's a table. It's a doorknob, maybe. So if I'm sick, I sneeze on a doorknob. Somebody else comes by, puts their hand on the doorknob, then puts that hand into their face where they can sicken themselves. Think about that. There's maybe four different steps there as opposed to just sneezing on someone. So you're much more likely to get ill by someone just being close to you. Then that last one is those tiny, tiny little aerosols that could potentially go much farther than six feet. We're not sure about those yet, and they're thought to be a lot less important as well. So right now, it's those kind of bigger aerosols that fall generally within six feet radius. All right, next slide, please. So given that... We know that these are CDC and all of our public health agencies have really prioritized these actions. And these are the things that we've kind of prioritized for you here to take on your farm. So that physical distancing, keeping people away from each other. So in case someone is infected, they're not getting those droplets right on someone else. Washing your hands really well has always been an important and it is, is especially important now because you can't get someone sick via those surfaces if you wash your hands well, because even if that doorknob is contaminated, if I wash my hands regularly, then I've broken that route of transmission by washing my hands. Cleaning and sanitizing those surfaces in case, again, someone has uh, sneezed or coughed onto that surface. Wearing masks has been shown to keep um, some of those droplets in if you are infected, so a really good idea. And then just really communicating your policies. All right, next slide. The good news is, is that many of you have already really good, good agricultural plans, good agricultural practices plans on your farms. These are things like washing your hands, training your employees not to work when you're sick, keeping your domestic pets and livestock out of the growing areas. Those still apply. Those are all really good. We're going to be adding a few more things um, specific to COVID, but I just want to be clear. It's not, it's not exactly completely separate from what you've been doing and definitely don't stop doing those good agricultural practices because we don't want a foodborne illness outbreak on top of the uh, the COVID pandemic. All right, next slide, please. Physical distancing is very important. We'll hear much more from Ryan and Natalie about specific uh, strategies to do that on your farm, but I do just really want to reiterate, it is the most important thing we can do, really keeping people apart from each other because we know the majority of those droplets are falling within those six feet, approximately, give or take. So 
it, that is kind of the thing we can do to keep our community safe. And I know that that will be a challenge um, given some setups, but I'm just kind of identifying that as one of the primary things that we can do on our farms and farmers markets and really wherever we are. All right, next slide. Hand washing, very important. So having hand washing, whatever that looks like at your farm, available to your customers, to your staff, to volunteers, whoever is out there working with your produce and handling and being out on your farm does need to be able to wash your hands. So train them what that looks like via signs or with your employees a more in-depth training, tell them when to wash their hands frequently throughout the day, certainly before handling produce, after using the restroom. You can rent or build your own hand washing stands, um, but it is really important to put up signage to remind people about your policies. On the next slide, we have some photos of hand washing stands. So on the left is one that's very common that you might see, or you might have a much bigger unit if you're a big farm. Still continue to use those, those are excellent. If you are a smaller farm or potentially for your workers out in the fields, you might have a portable hand washing stand. That's just to make it as easy as possible. Or you could just have this whole rig on the back of your pickup bed. That works just as well too. As long as there's flowing water, you're catching that water. It has that continuous flow valve so the water goes straight down. You have a place to put the garbage and you have soap and you have paper towels. You do need to dry your hands after washing them because wet hands are just gonna pick up all kinds of dirt and wet hands are, I know if I have wet hands, I'm gonna wipe them on my pants and we don't want people to do that. So you really do have to provide those single use paper towels. All right, next slide please. Hand sanitizers um, can't replace hand washing because they don't work in a lot of situations. So they're, they're, they do work, I want to be clear, they do inactivate the virus, but if your hands are already dirty, they don't, they don't work. The, the sanitizer just sits on top of that soil. So in that top picture, you see that person has pretty dirty hands. If they put a big glob of sanitizer on there, it's not clear how effective it will be probably not going to be super effective. The bottom, clean hands, think about your doctor's office, hand sanitizers do work in that situation. So if you have access to hand sanitizer, I know it can be hard to find right now, you can absolutely provide it to your customers if you want. If you don't want to or you don't have access to it, hand washing is actually a preferred, it, it is preferred because it will do a more thorough job. So even if people, if your staff is using it throughout the day, that's okay. I would definitely suggest that they are washing their hands in addition to um, using sanitizer. Maybe they're using sanitizer while handling money, for example, but they should also be washing their hands in addition to that. All right, next slide, please. Gloves, again, if you'd like to use them, that is fine. They, there might be certain circumstances, potentially when you're dealing with customers, again, where gloves might be a good choice. They aren't a replacement for hand washing. And if you think about it, if somebody came into your you know, payment area and they sneezed and there was a big glob of sneeze right on that table and I had a glove on and I put my hand in it, my hand is contaminated, that glove is contaminated just like it would be if I didn't have a glove on. So if I then didn't pay attention and went and touched a basket of strawberries, I could absolutely put that on there or I could give that, I could potentially spread that to another staff or another customer. So the gloves um, sometimes give a false sense of protection and that people might wear them all day. You need to change them as often as you would wash your hands. So pretty frequently, if they're torn, certainly change them. Again, if you have access to them and you want to wear them, go for it, but make sure that people know to wash their hands well before they put them on and then change them frequently. All right, next slide. Um, the CDC is recommending that everyone when out in public wear some sort of a face covering. And that's just because so many of us have this virus now. And Additionally, a lot of us have the virus and we don't know it because there are many, many more people than previously thought that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. They're not sick yet, but they do, they're able to infect other people. So wearing that mask doesn't protect you very much, but it protects your friend, protects the people that you're, you're near. So having everybody, this is not a requirement, but it might be a good idea to have everyone who comes on your farm wear that mask. And then you as the, as the manager also wear that mask. If you're doing field work by yourself or maybe with one other person and you're a, a substantial distance away, maybe not super important to wear a mask right then. But I would say if there's a, a number of people around or if you're closer in proximity with people, maybe if you're in the pack shed, I would definitely suggest wearing the mask. 
Don't touch your face when you're wearing it though. I see a lot of people messing around with it. They're maybe not used to them. Try to keep your hands out of your face because then you're so much more likely to infect yourself by touching your hand. And also you really do need to maintain that physical distancing when you're wearing them. All right, next slide. The surface, the virus on surfaces. So they haven't done a ton of research yet. They're doing more, but what we have right now is that they put a lot of the viral particle on a surface and then they saw how long it took for the vast majority of it to become inactive. And stainless steel and hard plastic was two to three days. So it, it could potentially be kind of a long time on a pick your own basket, however, or, or bucket. We do have to remember that those were kind of ideal lab conditions. It's, and also they, didn't, they don't really know if that RNA that they were able to detect at the end really could be transferred to another surface and get someone sick. It might not have been able to. So take home message, surfaces should be cleaned and sanitized, but it's not as if every surface needs to be continually sanitized and um, because we do know the majority of people are, are not getting sick via these surfaces. But it still is important to clean them in case someone on your farm um, did have it. So next slide, how do you do that? have a preventative sanitation routine. Again, this is not gonna be that different than your good agricultural practices, but it might, you might be doing things like the, your cash registers more, light switches, cooler handles, those high touch surfaces. So think about those and sanitize them regularly. Think about and then continue to sanitize your food contact surface like your tools, like your sorting tables. Those hopefully have already have a cleaning routine and you should just continue that. It is thought that the sanitizing rate, so that's generally the lower rate on the label, is adequate. This is this um, virus is actually sort of weak in the environment. It's it can make you real sick when it's in you, but on a surface, it it actually is pretty easy to inactivate. So that food contact surface sanitizing rate is adequate. If you have someone, say one staff member comes down with it, then you're going to contact your health department and they're going to lead you through a more in-depth disinfecting routine. But I'm just talking about basic prevention right now. When you're choosing a sanitizer, the EPA's list N is, uh, is the list that is th approximately 370 products that are approved for use against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So choose something off there. And then also just a note, you can't sanitize a dirty surface. So if you've got a cooler handle that has visible dirt on it, you'll need to clean that first before sanitizing. If it's clean, you probably can just spray it with a sanitizer. Occasionally, I would also clean it with soap and water as well, just to break down any funk that builds up. But on a you know day-to-day -day basis, sanitizing it a few days, a few times throughout the day is probably fine. The frequency is going to be what you determine. How much use is it getting? It's kind of your risk tolerance, and we can talk more about that. Okay, next slide. There are quite a few The to get to that 200 parts per million, which is the food contact sanitizing rate. It's a tablespoon per gallon. You do need to read the label and pay attention. It says two minutes air, air dry time. So uh, spray it. It needs to sit wet for two minutes and then you can wipe it off or just let it air dry. Sanidate 5.0 is an OMRI approved if you're organically um, certified farm. Then that Sanidate is, they're not actually on that list yet, but it, it is effective against the virus and they're, they're just going through the final processes of getting on that list. So Sanidate 5.0 is a nice product for that. All right, that's it for me. Right, thanks Annalisa. Um, so that was an overview of the best practices and it can be a little bit tricky to apply those best practices to the day-to-day -day operations of a farm. And so I'm going to go through some general um, suggestions about ways to do that and then you will hear from Ryan about very specific ways that they're doing it. So next slide. So as Val said at the beginning, there are not a lot of specific rules or guidelines for this. And I know that can be a bit frustrating. Sometimes it's easier to just kind of be told what you need to do. Uh, but take for example, if MDA said only 10 people can be in the picking area at one time, that really doesn't make sense just because farms are different sizes. You've got your rows oriented differently. And so ultimately um, what farms have to do in order to reduce risk is to just kind of go through your whole operations and identify ways to help people follow these best practices. Um, and so that's what this template is meant to help you do. Um, it's available both in Spanish and Annalise and I are both happy to 
work through that with you if you have questions um, or concerns about how, how those risk prompts that we've put in here um, apply to your farm. So next slide. So I'm gonna talk first about uh, the customer perspective and then I'll talk a little bit about employees as well. Um, so in order to make sure that customers are following best practices, you kind of have to make it easy and straightforward for them to do that. And so what I would recommend that all of you do before you open up for the season is to essentially take a walk in their shoes. So go to the part of your farm where they come in, probably a parking lot, and just walk through the entire operation. Um, think about how they're getting to the fields, how they're being directed to know which part of the fields pick in, how they're being kind of how you're directing them to pick in one area versus another and maintain physical distance in the field, where they're washing their hands, kind of all of those things so that you're making sure that people are following best practices that whole time. Um, and make sure you're communicating those policies really, really well so that someone knows exactly what they need to do when they arrive at your farm. So next slide, talk a little bit more about how that all might work um, or look. So first, make sure you're communicating your policies. Um, everything will go more smoothly if people have really clear instructions and expectations for what they need to do and what you're doing to make your farm um, a safe place to be. So ideally, um, use your social media, emails, web presence, all of that to get your policies out ahead of time. Um, but also don't assume that everyone is using those, um, those tools. So, also think about the person who's just driving on the road and they see a sign that says strawberries and they say, oh great, I'm gonna stop by. Do you have signs in the parking lot, for example, or staff who are gonna meet them and kind of guide them through the process? So this is just an example sign um, from Purdue. Yours can look as fancy or as simple as you want it to. But on the next slide here, we've got just a few things um, that everyone should be thinking about. So the first, is in order to really effectively do physical distancing on your farm, you kind of need to figure out the safe number of people to have in your pick your own area at a given time. And that's probably gonna shift throughout the season. So if you just have like one variety of apple that's ripe, your pick your own area is gonna be pretty small. And then throughout the season, as more varieties become ripe, the size is gonna change a little bit. Um, and so that's something you're gonna have to do pretty regularly is just think through how many people can actually be in the field at one time. We'll talk um, about orientation in the next couple slides. Um, and make sure that people have really clear instructions about how they're getting to the field um, and which fields they're supposed to be in. You also wanna designate a waiting area where people can be six feet apart safely. Um, even if your farm isn't that busy, I would say prepare for the busiest case scenario in case it happens so that if you have more people than your picking area can handle, you have a space already set aside. Um, and this isn't necessarily a recommendation, but just something to think about. You may wanna provide some pre-packed options uh, for people who don't wanna wait. As Annalisa said, make sure you have hand-washing stations all over the farm. The best case scenario is that everyone wears masks. Um, some people may not be comfortable enforcing that. The logistics of that may be difficult, but that would be the best case scenario. Things like don't eat while you pick, um, having a sanitation plan for all of your high touch surfaces. So what are you sanitizing? How often? With what? Who's in charge of making sure that you have enough bleach in stock um, or whatever sanitizer you're using? And then also having a really well organized reduced contact checkout system. And we'll give some examples of that too. So next slide. When we're thinking about staying physically distant in the field and what that orientation might be like, it's gonna be different for different farms. So if you have a really large apple orchard, like the picture on the left, it's a really different situation from the strawberry field on the right. So first we'll look at the apple orchard. So next slide. So a couple of things just to think about in this situation. In a really large farm, you're probably not gonna have parking right next to the field. So you need to think about how people are getting to and from the fields. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, your areas are probably gonna shift throughout the season of where people are picking and how large that area is. Um, so if people are having to take some form of transportation out to the field, ideally encourage walking, um, but acknowledge that there are people who are 
uh, mobility limited, it's still a good idea to make those options available for people just for kind of equity and access. But if you can get as many people as possible to walk, that will help to reduce the number of people who you're taking on the hay wagon or the golf court or the golf cart, for example. Um, some other ideas we've heard are people installing plexiglass between the driving section and the passenger section of a golf cart, for example. So just kind of think through how you can reduce those risks. Um, you're gonna have, you need to have specific picking areas for people. So a block where a group of people might go might be a whole row where you just say, this row is designated for this group of people and until they leave, no one else is coming in. Say you only have three rows and they're really long. Um, you could maybe do something in, like in this picture where this first block is for group A, this first or the second block is for group B. If you're gonna do that, make sure that your rows are wide enough that people can safely kind of pass by each other. So maybe like people pick on the north side only um, and then you have that, uh, the back portion designated as an aisle where people can walk past each other. But if you have a lot of canopy cover, um, you don't actually have a six foot plus aisle, you probably just have to have one group of people in that aisle at a time. Um, ideally, you would have hand washing stations at the entrance and the exit. So you would have one way traffic where people wash their hands as they come into the area, as well as when they leave. So the second scenario, um, just as a case study is a, oh, and I'll, so this is a nice diagram from Cornell, just kind of showing that process. So it's just like at the grocery store where you're in a long line and then you go to the register that's open. You could potentially have an employee kind of at the bottom there, keeping an eye on when people are done in certain rows so that they can direct the next group of people in. So the next scenario is a small strawberry farm. Um, so in this situation, Relative to apples, at least, you probably have more varieties um, ripening at the same time. So you may have more of your farm to work with at a given time, uh, but the rows are closer together. So it's not as easy to say this group in this row, this group in the next row, because that might not be enough space. Um, you may have parking closer to fields, so you don't need to worry about that as much. Um, but in this situation, that the rows are so close together that you would probably need to say, okay, so group one goes in row one the next group has to go in the third or the fourth row over you kind of have to measure that figure out how far apart your rows are but similar situation you could enter at one end and exit the other end and make sure to have hand washing at each end and then here are just some diagrams of that so in this first picture you can see the rows are or you don't have people in every row because they need to be a bit more staggered and depending on your field orientation if you have more natural blocks and walkways you can potentially have more people at a time since you have kind of smaller chunks of areas. All right. So that's just some ideas to think about field design. It's gonna look different on every farm, um, but once people get through the field, they're gonna have to check out somewhere. And this is something where we've learned a lot from farmers markets since they've been kind of the first group um, of fresh market vendors to have to figure this out. So ideally have a system that's really organized where you only have one person at a time coming up to check out. You don't have kind of clumping or grouping. Photo you can see they've got X's on the ground telling people where to wait so that um, people can be far enough away from each other as well as your employees. Um, in this picture, they've also got two tables. So that just gives you that much extra space to really enforce that distancing. Um, someone sent in a question before this webinar about sneeze guards. They're definitely not required, but they will help to uh, reduce some of that transmission of particles. Keep in mind, like I think sometimes when people start to add in those precautions, they loosen up on others. So even if you have a sneeze guard, you should still make sure that customers are six feet away from you. And the same goes with masks. Ideally, sanitize your hands between every single customer, but like Annalisa said, it's not a substitute for hand washing. So hopefully you're washing your hands regularly as well. Reduce cash payments. Um, one idea is to have more standard sizing so that you're not weighing things. It kind of reduces that contact, but also it makes it so that people are more likely to give you like a $5 bill or a $10 bill versus having to make exact change. It just reduces some of that touching. All right, next photo. 
So I've got just a couple of slides then thinking from the employee point of view. You also want to be thinking about how you're keeping your employees safe. And so one of the trickiest things on a farm is physical distancing. It can be really hard to do a lot of farm tasks when you're six feet away from each other. Um, so again, this, the template that we have is meant to help you identify some of these risks and solutions, but just kind of think through like, is there equipment that you have on your farm that requires two people to work closely together? How are you conducting team meetings? Can you do it when you're six feet apart? Can you do it virtually? Um, so just kind of try to get creative about those things. Some farms have set up teams where like two people will be paired together for the season. And so they can do tasks that require two people, but they're still not interacting with all of the employees. And so that helps to reduce risk as well, even if those two people are exposed to each other. And then of course, make sure people are staying home when they're sick, but also people can be, people can carry the virus even if they seem healthy and are not exhibiting symptoms. And so even if everyone seems healthy, make sure that you're still following these protocols. Next slide. In terms of training, um, again, it's a lot easier to follow best practices when you really understand what they are. And so making sure employees understand your policies is one thing. If they can help draft them, that's even better. When people feel like they're a part of something, it's a little bit easier to get on board with it. Um, also think about this is kind of an evolving, like your farm is gonna be a little bit different every week based on the activities that you're doing. And so make sure that you're revisiting those COVID policies. I would recommend regular, like at least weekly check-ins, if not more often, especially as customers start to come, um, just to make sure your policies are working and creating a space where your employees can say like, this didn't work for me, or I was in this situation where I didn't feel safe or I didn't have the equipment I felt like I needed. Having that space um, to kind of check in with each other will really help throughout the season. And then even if you're doing everything really well, you're trying really hard to have good policies and follow them, don't assume that you're not gonna get sick. So just think about like, if only one person knows how to drive the tractor and they get sick, are you gonna be stuck without a tractor? Um, so with, with those kinds of things, make sure you're training some backup people as well, just in case. And then finally, if someone does get sick, this is the recommendation from the CDC in terms of knowing when that person can come back to work. So you have to check off three boxes. You have to have not have a, had a fever for 72 hours. So that's three full days without the use of medicine. So if you're taking ibuprofen, that can reduce your fever artificially. So you have to have, have not had a fever for three days without medicine. All of your symptoms have to have improved and at least seven days have to have passed since your symptoms first appeared. And so if you can check off each of those boxes, the CDC says that it's sufficiently not risky for you to come back to work. So with that, I think that was all of the general um, recommendations. Thank you, Natalie. That was awesome. Um, I think you provided some really good uh, general things for people to think about, okay, how do I apply that to my farm? Um, so next, we're going to listen to Ryan Femling from Afton Apple Orchard, which is in Afton, Minnesota. Uh, for those that don't live in Minnesota, Afton is a few minutes um, southeast of the Twin Cities. So they've got a lot of customers coming from the Twin Cities to get, you know, that farm and that fall festival experience. Um, Ryan, if you would like to unmute your mic. Thanks. So are you there? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. So um, first, just can you tell us really briefly um, about your farm? Like what crops do you have? How big you are? That kind of thing. We have about a three, 300 acre farm and we are known, we've been doing pick your own produce for 30 years. We have apples, raspberries, strawberries, pumpkins, all the fun agritainment stuff that comes along with that too. Awesome. And then this next slide should have showed up. So in general, what are some of the changes your farm is considering this season in light of COVID-19? Um, we're well, gonna, you know, go course. through these in kind of more detail. So just if you wanna just kind of give a, a brief overview first. Well, instead of everybody being all over the place, it's gonna be more of a in an entrance and an exit and 
hand, more hand washing stations put up so we can have them kind of wash up when they come in, wash up when they go out. A lot of our activities will be limited to so many people we might not, might not be doing. A lot of the activities that we do do, as far as our um, hay wagons, um, our playground, our jump pad and stuff like that. So it's going to be a change after 30 years of inviting families and kids and everything to our farm. It's definitely going to be something different. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's something that a lot of us are struggling with right now. And this, so you sent these photos to me today. Um, the photo on the upper left, can you describe, is that typically your, uh, your store? Your that is our retail store for our strawberry patch. And usually there's a line out the door and there's two sides to the red center part there that you can see. So in lieu of this, we're gonna probably have to put up some, a spacer between the counter and to the shelves that are on the right side, or to even eliminate the shelves to give us more space if that's what we decide to get people in from the field to weigh their produce, their strawberries. Okay. okay. And then um, the the bottom photo on the left, I think we'll get into these conversations in a couple of slides, but on the left, that's, you know, is that your kind of fall festival area? Yeah, that's our, that's our playground. We're known for our playground. Um, it does get used in the summer with strawberries too, because of, we do do some uh, after school programs or day school programs for strawberry tours. And so that's something that we have to eliminate this summer is not being able to educate the um, children on strawberries. Okay. And then the picture to the right, that's your hay wagon. So is that usually what you would use to transport people out to the strawberries and apples? Yes, that's our one of our hay wagons with our transportation specialist on it. Um, so now we're going to have to pretty much have a majority of the people walk. And if there are some elderly people that need help, we will uh, um, have to customize some kind of a different ride for them or space them out on our hay wagons. Okay. All right, so speaking of um, spacing people out and what we're calling social distancing of customers. So we're thinking about things like keeping people separated while they're picking, but not only while they're picking, also in transportation, like you were just talking about, to and from the fields as well as a checkout. So can you kind of walk us through how customers are gonna be moved through the farm once they get there? So the picture on the bottom left, that's as you enter, come down our driveway, there's parking on both sides and there's also strawberry fields on both sides. As you get up to the building on the left, the tan building, there's usually a greeter that greets you and tells you pretty much where to go in a nice way. Get to your boxes and and right around that area is where you wait for the hay wagon. Now we're gonna have to put up fences so that way they come in, they have to go by a hand wash station or hand sanitizers and then walk, of course, out to the field. And then as they, the picture in the upper right is the exit, if they do come out of the building, um, that used to be parking and stuff, customers used to pull up close to the building and stuff. We're going to have to make that more of an area for a curbside pickup for the pre-pick or people that want, don't want to that you know place an order online or by phone. And then of course we have our concession berry barn there. Not quite sure how that's going to run. Um, that'll just have to be marked out, maybe moved over a little bit, and set up so there is a the social distancing part of that. Is the concession barn the red one in the picture? Yep, that's our berry barn. That's our concessions. Okay. Um, so the the tan colored building, is that the same building we saw before? That's the same building we saw before. That's just where the people exit from. They come in the back side of that from, from the strawberry field into that, then they exit out the front where the strawberry is on the front. Okay, so just to be clear, do you think people are still going to be going through the building at all, or are you just going to funnel them, say, in front of or in back of the building to pay? I think it is could probably, if, as the crowds increase, we're probably going to have to move more outside, but on the slower rain days when there's not as many people there, I think we can social distance coming through the building just okay. easy, mm -hmm. just as easy. If not, we'll have to set up 
Um, on the back of the building where people do entrance, we used to have 10 by 12, 10 by 20 canopies and stuff that people would wait in the shade. Uh, we're just gonna have to put them out farther away from the building and space them out farther. Okay, that makes sense. And then have you guys thought through a plan yet of how you're gonna have people picking? I mean, you probably had a plan in place already of telling people where to go to pick, right? How do you think that's gonna be changing? I think what we're planning on is, because our row spacings are four, the rows are four feet apart. So we will try and see how it works, but try to pick every other row. And then our fields are cut into sections, roughly 200 foot section, there's actually a pathway that cuts across, across the rows. So we can have an entrance and an exit. And I think it's possibly that we might just have to we don't want to, we'll see how the groups go, but we're gonna have to limit the size of the groups that come into our fields. Okay, and I know that um, we've had some questions about this and it was um, discussed on a webinar that the Wisconsin berry growers put on about potentially um, having an age limit and uh, requesting that families don't come with young kids. Is that something that you guys are considering at all? We're trying to consider that, but it's really tough. We're, you know, we're, we're based with families. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's our thing. That's why we're here. That's why we've been doing this for 30 years. And that's what our family's goal is. is that's our next generations that come in to it, into our farm or anybody's farm. And, you know, for that fact is we're having a hard time figuring out if what we, what we really want to do at that point. Right. That's totally understandable. Because we have our family, we got nieces and nephews and stuff all over that are coming and they're gonna be there too. How are we gonna say they can be here but nobody else can? That's gonna be difficult. Yep, absolutely. Um, I imagine that that's a topic that people might have more questions about too. Um, but for now, I guess we should move on to uh, kind of the next topic, which is sanitation. Um, so if people have further questions for Ryan, you can type those into the chat box. As far as sanitation, so we're thinking about things like picking containers, hand wash stations, hand sanitizers, and then the question of masks or other ideas that you might have. And so the bottom two photos you sent to me, the top one I got from your website. Um, so the, can you talk about your hand sanitizer and your hand wash stations? Um, we, our hand sanitizer stations, we've had a lot of them set up as four hand sanitizers and on one stand. Uh, probably got eight or ten of them. We've usually just had a few of them out but now we're definitely going to put more out or make more of them so they are more accessible to our customers. We also have more hand wash stations that you see on the bottom right that we will be setting out into the field so people can wash and take care of what they need to. And uh, some, oh sorry go ahead. As far as our picking containers go, it'll be, it'll have to be our boxes that we have. We let them bring in their own containers over the years, um, but with our own boxes, it'll make it a lot easier for getting the fruit from the field and out the door into their car so they can go home. Okay. And uh, somebody had asked a question on the chat about um, the volume of water that might be used up if people are choosing to wash their hands for 20 seconds. Um, so you have, that looks like a rented uh, hand wash station, right? Do you, how does that refill? No, we, that, we own those. Okay. We own a couple similar to that. Um, so basically there's a tank on the inside that's separated from your gray water and your fresh water. And as it cycles through, then when it, it's full and actually run out of water you have to um, pump it out okay dispose of it uh that one's 65 gallons i believe and it it can go through quite a few people before we have to refill it or drain it so awesome that's pretty slick and it's pretty simple because with the foot pump they can't waste a lot of water they got to do the exercise to get the water to wash their hands so there's a, sometimes when they're soaping up, there's a break between when they rinse their hands that, you know, so you're saving water that way. Yeah, right, right. Okay, 
And then there's this other goal of reducing lingering on the farm. And uh, if people read the suggestions that MDA has put out, um, some of the suggestions have to do with this. So this is uh, reducing, you know, kind of the time that people might be standing around on the farm, um, potentially breaking the social distancing. And again, these are, we're talking about recommendations here, um, not, you know, it's not, uh, rules, but recommendations. So this might look a lot different for each farm. Um, but you guys have a big fall festival, as you've been talking about, families are hugely important for your business. So can you talk about how your fall festival or your other on-farm activities throughout the season might be changing this year? I guess we really haven't discussed how, what's going to happen with the fall season. Um, the way everything's changing by opening other things up. We're going to have to wait and see. It's a big, we, I get, we don't have an answer for that. It's, it might just be at the come in, get your, pick your apples and pay and go, no lingering or get your food to go. I mean, it's just, I don't know how exactly that's going to work. It's, you know, we're a pretty big operation along with a lot of other farms and stuff. We just don't know the answer to that. Right. And the fall is, you know, it, it feels far away right now. Might not feel far away in a few weeks, but right now it does. Right now it's quite a ways away. It's, you know, strawberry season's around the corner, but you know what? Things are changing and we don't, you know, I don't think anybody has the direct answers. All we can do is be careful what we do. Yep, for sure. Hey, somebody asked a question uh, for you. Will you be weighing strawberries for the U-Pick and how do you plan to handle a possible congestion of people wanting to check out at the same time? Uh, yeah, we've thought about having one size all, fits all container at our one price per box. But sometimes it's fair, it's not fair to some people because some people will be, you know, you fill a level box and other people that'll be 10 pounds and other people will try to fit 15 or 16 pounds in a box. It's not fair to them, so I think what it's going to boil down to is we're going to have to have multiple stations, and we'll have to have sneeze guards up, and they'll have to handle their own fruit. Basically, they'll weigh, grab it, pay, and go. Okay. And another question. Somebody wants to know um, about the farm's online presence and whether you guys think it's feasible to set up, like, slots where people can sign up for specific times to come and pick so that there's only so many people there at the same time. Ooh, that's a tough one. It's, yeah. We're, you know, it's, we're a fairly large operation. It'd be very hard to try to, we need a heck of a lot more staff to be able to do that, I would think. And we just get a lot of people from the cities that would just, that just take a drive and they come and it's, we don't, I don't, I don't know, if anybody has any suggestions, you can email me or anything, but we just don't, we don't know. We can't, sure. it's, it's a lot. You know, if you're a smaller farm, you could probably do that for a few hours during the day, but we get quite a few customers. We got a, quite a few berries that we got to get rid of and it's, or, you know, sell. So it's, I don't know, that's something to check into. We we'll guess we'll be looking into that. And then, um, so this is a photo you sent me today too. Uh, that looks like that's your, some of your family members and maybe employees. Yep, that's our crew. That's after a nice hot day of people in the strawberry patch enjoying a strawberry shake. <laughs> um, so how do you think you're gonna be communicating with your crew this year about the changes that you're making? Uh, we're just gonna, we're gonna have to have our training you know, like we usually do every year before our employees come back and discuss them with what's going on and do what, you know, the health department and CDC recommends a six feet apart and wearing a mask and hand washing and stuff. Um, we'll eliminate our picnic tables and stuff so there won't be any seating really for people. Um, think about the picnic tables, I think that's significant. Um, so you are thinking about getting rid of the picnic tables? Well, it's, it's, if we, we have to figure out a way that we can sanitize them. Our picnic tables right. are wood. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if just putting a, 
tablecloth on the seat in the top is going to be good enough or we might have to look into some other surface that's more clean you know maybe folding tables and or plastic tables and chairs or something that we can clean or sanitize better i don't think there's anything out there that can sanitize wood okay and then what about communicating with customers about these changes do you uh, that's where facebook is your friend yeah um, between Facebook and our website, that's where we post a lot of our stuff and then we're just going to have to set our, get our ground rules and try to hope everybody obeys by them. And um, I know Natalie mentioned an example of some signage. Is that something that you guys have talked about? Like if, for those who might not follow you on Facebook, um, having some kind of sign uh, as they come in? Yep, we're working on getting some signs figured out what we want to do um, as far as the social distancing and the six feet and the wash hands when you go in, wash hands when you go out, um, curbside pickup only, yeah, you know, so basically the same thing that every store or restaurant that's open now are doing and having the signage to let them know that, you know, because you're in the country doesn't mean that the stuff goes away, that stuff's still here, so. Yeah. Um, let's see. So another question came in about how do you sanitize surfaces and registers and picking baskets, or maybe rather, how are you planning on um, sanitizing those surfaces? Uh, surfaces that we can, we will be using more probably, a, you know, the bleach solution. Um, I'm a firm believer in Sanidate. So um, between those two choices, we'll just have to regularly put more than likely to be me walking around and helping wipe up and clean up things and make sure that, that you know frequently touched objects and stuff are clean okay um and as we're wrapping up this discussion uh feel free again to type any questions you have into the chat um, whether those are for ryan or for any of the um speakers who went before um let's see what else do we have? I think that might be the last slide I have for you. Ryan, do you, while people are typing in questions, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't have a chance to get to? No, I think everybody covered the majority of everything. It's just how everybody's going to implement it to their farms. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has got any ideas, you know, we're all in this together. Please share. So hopefully we can, everybody can get through their seasons coming up and still go on with our lives. Yep. So um, this could be a question for, I think any of the speakers, uh, somebody asked this question over email in preparation for the webinar. We use flags in our field for customers to place in the field where they stopped picking, you know, so that the next customer knows where to start picking. Uh, should we be sanitizing those between each customer? So I guess first I want to ask to Ryan, how do you communicate with customers about where they should pick in the field? Uh, the flag system. So that's okay. a good question. I, it's probably going to have to be something that it is sanitized or make a smaller section where we don't need flags. Okay. Um, instead of going a couple hundred feet, maybe we'll have to go down to 20 or 30 feet and hopefully they do a good job picking. I don't, that's a good, that's a good point. Natalie, I think you had offered up an idea too earlier when we were talking about how people might deal with those flags. <laughs> do you remember what I said? Well, <laughs> I <jumped>. oh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you were talking about um, maybe having a box for the used flags afterwards so uh at the end of the day um a crew member could sanitize all of those at once rather than somebody having to continually sanitize flags throughout the day yeah flags are really cheap um it's not a bad idea to just have enough on hand that you don't have to worry about it throughout the day mm -hmm. annie i think i had said that um <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was just the idea. First of all, remember that the surfaces are not our primary way that we're, someone might get sick on our farm. 
not to be forgotten about, but don't maybe spend so much time thinking about something like the flag. But that being said, that is being held by someone, potentially sneezed on by someone. So one way to do that is if you have enough flags, have a box, mark it, the date that you are putting them in there, and then just set them aside for a day or two, and then rotate in new ones. I would suggest cleaning them occasionally, but letting them sit for a day um, or two might might work there to give the the virus if it was there time to inactivate. So there's another question here um, about kind of sanitizing and people touching the same things. So the question from Valerie is: the handles on our picking trays are wood. What do you suggest we use to sanitize between uses? Maybe Annalisa, you could answer and even talk a little bit more broadly about packaging, just because that is a question that seems to come up a lot. Yeah, and so wood is a porous surface, so it's different than your hard plastic or your stainless steel, so it's, it's less ideal, but you can definitely spray it with sanitizer, so you can make sure it's clean and free from visible dirt and then spray with your sanitizer and then let it air dry. So you can do that. Know that if there was enough of the viral load, if a real, if an infection person put a lot of the viral load in there, it can soak in to that wood. So not ideal, but if that's what you have, that's what you have. And you can absolutely do your best to sanitize that. And then in picking buckets in general, a best practice is to not allow people to bring theirs from home, just kind of out of an abundance of caution right now. And when you're sanitizing your own, again, just clean them of the visible debris. If there's smashed strawberries in there, just spraying a sanitizer on that won't do much good. You gotta walk out first, spray it with the sanitizer and and let it air dry or follow the label. But generally that's what the what the label says. We received a couple of questions about bathrooms over the last couple weeks. And I realized that's something we didn't touch on much in the webinar. So um, first, Ryan, what do you guys do for your bathroom facilities? Uh, we're strictly porta potties. Okay. Uh, we don't have any indoor facilities, um, especially in the strawberry patch for customers to use. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, I don't know, I guess we're kind of lucky. We're kind of, on a first name basis with our porta potty company. So if we need them cleaned and filled, they're here. Uh, so, but I, we do have a couple of employees that are really good at taking on the task of keeping them clean. So I think it'll be easy if we have to, you know, pressure wash them and sanitize them ourselves, we'll, we will make the means to do that. Okay, awesome. So that sounds like an example of something you guys are already doing pretty well as far as sanitation. Um, and I've gotten a couple questions from people um, where I think there's a little bit of confusion about bathrooms. Um, somebody asked, should we only offer bathrooms to customers as a last resort? And Annalisa, can you comment on on that or on the porta potty question? Yeah, just, just certainly do not stop offering porta potties because you think that it might, it might be a, more of a risk because there might be contamination happening there. In that situation, if you took away porta potties, it would be more risky because your chances of foodborne illness with someone going to the bathroom on the side of your field is far outweighs any risk of spreading the the disease in your porta potty. So don't get rid of the porta potties. Certainly have them if you don't have them, um, because customers and employees need to use need a place to go to the bathroom. Or if you have a very small crew and you know your indoor facility is sufficient, then that's the decision you make. That's totally fine as well. But I would say, yep, just making sure that those are cleaned and sanitized regularly. Again, that frequency is really determined by you and how many people are using it a few times throughout the day, going in and wiping down the handles, the, the faucets, the doorknobs. I would definitely keep a log sheet of that as well. It can just be on the wall, it can be somewhere, uh, it can be electronic, but just re a reminder because that might be something that you just forget to do in the, in the busy season. Um, One thing we discussed um, as an option, definitely not required, but just to help people feel better, because I think there's kind of 
people have this feeling of panic around bathrooms right now. It's like, if you're able to access them, having like sanitizing wipes so that people could like wipe down the seat, that might help people feel better. Um, and that log is not just for you to remember to be sanitizing, but I think that's also a way that people can feel better about using porta potties on the farm is that if they see that you're sanitizing it, they're going to be less like just concerned about it. So I'm going to pause for a second. There are so many questions, which is great. And earlier, Annalisa, Natalie, and I talked about how the three of us don't mind staying on longer to answer questions. I don't know if Ryan and Valerie are, are, are willing to do that. They did not agree to that. Um, so just quick before people start logging off, if, if you want to log off, you can. If you want to stay, you can. But um, we do have two very uh, quick evaluation questions that I would appreciate if people could fill out. There's just three of them actually. Um, so I'll just have this up as we continue talking. All right. Ryan and Val, if you are logging off, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us today and contributing your expertise. Um, I, it's, I know that people really value hearing from other farmers when it comes to uh, sensitive, tricky topics like this. So thank you very much but you're welcome to also stay on and, and continue with the conversation if you'd like. I can stay on for a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Annie. I'm, I'm sorry, I do have to sign off so I can go uh, pick up kids from daycare, so thanks. No worries at all, thank you. Yep. So going back to the porta potty conversation, someone asked how often should porta potties be cleaned? that it really depends on how often they're getting used. There isn't a one answer because if there's a thousand people going through there on a busy October Saturday versus right now when there might be five people, it, it's based on use. So that's something that you'll have to monitor and pay attention to. If it's getting dirty, if it's getting visibly dirty, it also is getting dirty with things that we can't see. So keeping it visibly clean and keeping a log sheet to remind yourself how many times to do it. So right now it might just be once a day and um, you know, maybe less if there's only one or two of you, but in the heat of the season, a few times a day, I would say of sanitizing those high touch surfaces. So uh, uh, the other thing that I'll just quick say is sometimes people rely on the companies to do it. And like Ryan said, they might come out once a week in the heat, in the high season, that might not be enough. So you'll probably have to do it more frequently. All right. Um, somebody had a suggestion as far going back to the um, the buckets or the picking containers on our blueberry farm. We plan to line our buckets with clear plastic bags. Hopefully, that will help with sanitation between customers. Um, someone else said, "What do you do with the gray water from the hand washing station?" So it, this might be a question for Ryan. Uh, usually we just take and open up the cap on the septic tank and dump it in there so that way it doesn't have a contaminates anything else that's the only thing I can come up with uh, for now if anybody has any suggestions but that's just what we do I I don't like dumping it on the ground and that just seems the most sanitive sanity you know sanitized way to do something okay yeah he's dealing with a lot of water but to be clear it doesn't it's except if you have every once in a while a local inspector will say that water needs to go through a septic but it it really doesn't and i believe they had that issue there um come up and i know it's come up on a few other farms if you're dealing with smaller amounts of water you absolutely just put it off don't do not pour it right where people are walking certainly don't water your vegetables with it but pour it off in the tall grass um you know maybe over a gravel road water a tree get it out of the way but it's it's does it's very low risk it certainly is not as far from raw sewage or something so just kind of get it out of the way so it's not muddy and stuff but he's got a lot of water so that would that would make it pretty muddy so it's it's putting it down the septic is a good way to handle that there all right, um, this is a question from the beginning of the presentation. I'm kind of trying to scroll back to get to the questions that we missed. Um, how effective is it for companies that shut down for two days or so to deep clean and sanitize? Is this more of a feel good activity or PR or does that actually work? Uh, 
those are the CDC guidelines, and they're based on the fact that so your your preventative sanitation is you don't know that anybody you have no reason to believe anybody is having large amounts of particles potentially put onto your surfaces if you have a confirmed case it is a good idea to do a deeper clean it's just a, it's a precaution that i i certainly would hope i would want to do that if i were a staff person working at a farm i would want that done and i i think most people would to clarify though is there any reason to take two days off? Like you could do a deep clean in the evening at the end of the day and open the farm the next day, right? Okay. She's nodding yes. <laughs> yeah, and that would be, you know, clear that with MDH, of course. But it sure seems like it. Somebody had asked a question about hand washing stations. This is a really good question. Should hand washing stations be at the exit be placed before or after the checkout counter? Yeah, and I had wrote and said, you know, it really is up to you. It seems like it would be a nice thing to have it before the checkout because then that's just one more step to protect your staff who's handling the money and the cards. It would be nice. I mean, if you're doing it at the very end, well, you're, you're kind of protecting your customers as one last here before I leave but it sure would be nice to do it right before your staff who's gonna be interacting with those people all day. I don't know if other people have thoughts. And I would say ideally both, right? Like I think after your customers are checking out, they're gonna probably want to wash their hands before they go home, just so they're not like, if they had to touch money and now they're gonna go like touch their steering wheel, ideally you could have it in both locations. Um, another option would be if someone just washed their hands before they came in to check out, you could probably put some hand sanitizer like right on the table where they check out since their hands are clean. So as much as possible. Okay. Um, can you speak to the length of time that people need to be in close proximity in order to create risk? Uh, Kevin says, I have read that the guidance of six feet between people is intended for prolonged interactions of 15 minutes or longer. Of course, we have all read all kinds of things on the internet. Obviously, we endure passing and short interactions in grocery aisles in all kinds of places. What does the science say? Yeah, and I just wrote that the science says if you're infected and you sneeze, breathe, cough, have viral particles transmitted to someone else who then inhales them, you can absolutely transmit the, the illness regardless of duration of interaction. So it kind of, you know, if, if you're in long periods, yes you know, close proximity to someone, absolutely the likelihood is going to increase because you're going to be sharing more droplets. The, the droplets still could transfer in short duration interactions. And it's true that people are passing by each other in grocery stores all the time, but I, we all just have to do our best to, to keep apart. Just because people are close together in grocery stores doesn't mean that we should be close together everywhere. Okay. And what was the ratio of Clorox and water to use as a sanitizer for a surface? Like uh, in his case, it's a copper tabletop. Yep, so that food contact sanitizing rate is 200 ppm, which you can test with a little tester strip that are pretty easy to get. And that is a tablespoon in a gallon of water at a 6% concentration of bleach. Awesome, thank you. All right, I'm trying to catch up to the questions. Um, will the berries be safe to eat? if we are spraying wooden picking buckets with bleach or other sanitizer and letting them air dry? Yes, as long as you are using that food contact rate, that's why it's nice to use that low rate because that's what it's approved for, food contact surfaces, utensils, you know, cutting boards, tables, whatever, because that lower rate, if you use that higher rate, you're going to have to rinse it off afterwards because that higher rate can leave a residue that can, um, get on onto the berry onto the fruit so using that lower rate let it air dry that's that's the approved rate okay um another good question has anyone considered doing a flat rate bucket where the customers take the bucket home uh, maybe adding 50 cents to a dollar to the price for the bucket cost since they would be keeping the bucket along with offering cardboard boxes and by the pound customers can choose which option works for them then you aren't having to sanitize and wait for picking containers to dry? 
actually, Ryan, do you guys uh, charge by the pound? Or I know you mentioned the, you know, the issue with flats where somebody might fill 10 pounds in a flat, somebody might do 15. So are you strictly charging by the pound? Yes, we charge by the pound um, just to keep it fair for everybody. Um, and our, our boxes, we don't, we don't charge for our boxes. We let the customers take them home with them. We just ask that either recycle them correctly or they bring them back, which they can't anymore from, you know, the previous years. So um, this would be a one-time use, take them home, recycle them and be done. Do you picture a scenario where your customers come this year and they bring their old containers from last year, hoping to reuse them and you're gonna have to say, nope, we can't take those anymore? Yes, we have some boxes that we've had that some of our customers have had for many, many years, 10, 15 years plus. They pick their strawberries in them. They've had their grandkids pick strawberries in them. And I'm sure we're going to have some people that are not going to want, they're going to put a, you know, put up a fight because are it's just something that they've done for generations. Are these the cardboard flats or something these, else? These are the cardboard flats. Our old ones were a waxed covered oh. cardboard flat and now our other ones our new ones are actually cardboard that are covered with the mineral oil so they make okay. some 100 percent recyclable do you think you're going to communicate with customers over like your email list or facebook or something about that yep we have an email list and we'll definitely get that out there it's our mailing list basically so we'll get that out there and we'll facebook it and our website what we what our changes are what we have to do Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything to say in response to Chris's question about the um, maybe charging customers to take the bucket home? So the, I would just read that last comment in the chat box. I think that was insightful. Oh, okay. I'm still scrolled up in the chat box. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll read it. So Don says, last year we changed to uh, purchasing picking containers that they take home instead of weighing them. It has saved us a lot of time at checkout and people do fill them to different amounts, but I think it all evens out. Mm, okay. Great. I would say that the main argument for doing that system is that if people are using cash, um, you know, if it ends up being like $9 and 88 cents, that's a lot more back and forth transaction where you have to touch hands. Um, if you're doing a card system or some sort of contactless system, it's less of a big deal. Um, and you don't have to do it. It's just something to think about. A lot of people have asked if we're gonna be sharing these slides via email. Yes, I always, uh, the presentation is recorded and we always send out the recorded presentation a couple of days afterwards once we have time to process it. Um, but I think that we can also share a PDF version of the slides as well, because I know there's a lot of um, links in there that you might want to click on. Um, somebody says Mayberry Farms, Wisconsin. So Mayberry Farms, wi.com seems to have a good plan in place. Uh, if people wanted to look at that, he found it helpful. Um, how are employers testing body temperatures of employees? Are, are people doing that? So it, it really varies from farm to farm. Um, I think most farms have a rule that employees should not come to work if they're sick, but the way that people are choosing to enforce that is different. On one end of the spectrum, people are saying like, employees should just self monitor and be responsible for that. There are farms that have like logs that people have to like sign off every day. Um, employers in some cases are just buying um, thermometers for all of their em employees and saying you need to check every morning. Um, so it, it's kind of up to the farmer or the manager to decide how you want to do that. Um, and it is, it is a good thing to do, but also do keep in mind there are a lot of people who are asymptomatic. And so don't assume that just because people don't have fevers, they're not sick or that they don't have this virus. Um, so make sure that you're still practicing all the same procedures, basically, um, assuming that someone could be carrying the virus. Okay. Actually, one more thing I will say, um, there have been a lot of discussions about like the, the temperature guns where you like hold it a few inches away from someone's head. Um, and just that 
they're not very accurate, that to have a really accurate one, you have to spend a lot of money. Um, Annalise, I don't know if you have any more insight to that, but that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, people have definitely found that. They are all over the board. And then also, you have to know what you're going to do with that information. Um, if you gather that somebody does have a, a elevated fever, know exactly what your cutoff is and know exactly what the next steps are. Um, yeah, it, it could get dicey. And also really make sure that you're not have if you were testing customers, although maybe it was more about staff, if you're testing customers, you could absolutely create a bottleneck where it was actually more risky because people are, are waiting for that testing to occur. So think twice about that. If it was staff, I think I've heard it's much more common for staff to um, self-determine if they are sick and take their own symptoms and then report those out. And just with this follow-up question from Rose, do we need to document taking temperatures each day? Um, you, you don't need to have records of that. You can just say, employees, take your temperatures. If you're sick, stay home. You probably want a record if someone does stay home um, for sick time purposes, but you don't need to have a record saying that everyone doesn't have a temperature every day. All right. Um, I want to do a couple questions that we had received via email before. Uh, one of them is, okay, so she has a petting zoo at the farm. Should we consider roping off our petting zoo to close off access, or can we still do the petting zoo, but just have hand washing stations available? And part of my response to this would be, um, you have to not just think about the sanitation issue uh, associated with the petting zoo, but also a petting zoo is something that encourages people to linger on the farm. And so that may become a challenge for social distancing, especially with kids, right? Like they, <laughs> the, the kids are not going to stay six feet apart. So um, that's something where I think if you did choose to have the petting zoo, you would need to figure out some system for keeping kids separated. Yep, consider, I, I would say, if you're making choices about what to do on the farm, think, will it reduce lingering and congregating of people? If it will increase congregating of people, let's think about something else. And if having the petting zoo, we know people are drawn to goats. Goats are cute. They're going to want to pet the goats. And also, of course, if you did have it, you would have to have hand washing there. Um, but it would, it would definitely increase lingering and congregating. I, would I know this is a bummer. Like part of what we love about UPIC farms is all the fun things associated with them. But we're just trying to provide um, solutions for the current situation we're in. All right, another one. Is it appropriate to use a golf cart to transport customers who have mobility issues? Since a lot of farmers are talking about maybe not doing their like hay rack rides, but there are still gonna be people who can't walk. So this is a tricky question um, because it, it is really hard. I don't even know if it's possible to have six feet between the driver and the rider on a golf cart. Um, the, what I mentioned earlier as a suggestion was some people have installed plexiglass barriers. So you have a complete wall basically between the driver and the rider. Um, and in that situation, ideally both people could wear masks, um, just kind of assuming we get into a lot of theoretical <laughs> stuff here, but like you could breathe out and those particles could go in the wind around it, that kind of stuff. It's I, like, we really don't have a lot of information. Um, but if you're able to install a physical barrier between the driver and the rider, that's a way to reduce the risk of that. Um, and then obviously only take one person at a time or if people are like from the same household, like just to maintain distance there. So it's not ideal, um, but if that's the way that you're able to get people from place to place, that's the option that you have, so. And Ryan, I see that you're still on too. So um, we kind of breezed over this. You had talked about how you probably won't be using the, uh, the Hayrock ride this year or at least that's something you're considering. But with the setup that you have, um, do you still see a scenario where you're somehow going to have to transport customers out to the field, or will they be driving up closer to the field? Oh, yeah, we're still debating. I think 
we're going to have people that aren't able to walk all the way out to the field. Um, we are going to have to use a hayride or some kind of a trailer um, that's separated and not bring out a whole group of people at once, maybe just one or two or just the family or something on our hayrides. Um, I also don't know how you would sanitize a bale of straw or hay, but um, I guess that's just a chance we're going to have to take and just use the social distancing as a as our savior, I guess. Okay. I would also add, um, just think about your space. Like if there's one portion of your field that's really accessible by road, maybe you could make that like a limited mobility picking area so that people could drive their own cars there. Like just even if a golf cart is the way that you've always done it, try to, I guess, think about other options that there might be that you haven't explored before. All right, one more question from email. If we do a pick your own on an appointment basis, such as having people sign up online beforehand, what do we do if walk-ins show up anyway, which they will? Anyone have ideas or suggestions about that? Okay, so we discussed this before. Um, two options that we thought of were Either just like if you have a waiting area, just like have them wait in that area until it opens. Another would be say you have like 15 rows where people are able to pick and each of those rows is designated to one group of people. Maybe you could set it up where like 10 of those rows are available to reserve ahead of time and you leave the other five for walk-ins. Um, so yeah, I basically don't let more people into the area than you have deemed safe to have in that area and have designated spaces for those people to wait. Um, and I would say also have pre-packed options available in case people don't wanna wait. All right, thanks. Um, somebody had a suggestion for picking containers. Um, and we're talking about how to decrease the interaction between the employee um, at the counter taking change and uh, and the person paying. So his suggestion is you could use a smaller picking container and charge more, um, maybe three sizes of containers, small, medium, and large with a different price associated with each. And I think this is, uh, from what I saw when I lived out in Pennsylvania and I would do pick your own, I found that this was fairly common out there for crops like raspberries to just charge by the container size. And so I think it might be, uh, it, it, this might be something that culturally varies depending on the area of the country, but it also varies by crop. So for strawberries, the, the cardboard flats are super common um, and the weight can vary a lot. So um, charging by the size in that case could, could cause you to lose money, but um, something like raspberries, you know, if you're just charging like $5 per pint for raspberries, um, I have seen that done before. And then you're just, they might just be handing over a $5 bill or a $10 bill what, rather than you having to rummage around for a bunch of change. Um, but I've also been to businesses where they say we highly encourage you to use credit cards instead of using cash. Um, and that can really decrease the amount of interaction because you can have credit card machines where you as the employee don't even have to touch the machine. It's just the customer. Um, Wow, what other questions do we have? I I think we've almost gotten to the end of our questions. Um, I, I see one here, do we need to document taking temperatures each day? I think we kind of talked about that one, right? Because yeah, we were answering the questions about, you know, there's no requirement, but uh, you could, you know, especially document if you have somebody who's sick. Um, somebody said we are going to use Venmo since we since they have no fees. Okay, that's a great suggestion. Um, there have been a couple of questions about masks uh, said in different ways. One of them was, are masks required for workers picking berries or doing pre-pick sales? And another one is, do we have to require customers to wear masks? And I, I'd like somebody to reiterate uh, the answer to that one because I think it's really important. Annalisa, can you talk about the lack of mask requirement? Yep. Yeah, there is no requirement. In some states, there is. 
and there's not in Minnesota, but that should indicate how important masks are, that some states are saying, yes, everybody while well in public does need to have a face covering on. So it's not a legal requirement here, um, but it absolutely is a best practice because if you have it and you don't know you have it because you don't have symptoms or you haven't showing symptoms yet, it keeps those droplets in. So it really protects your, your neighbor, the people around you. So having your staff wear them would be a great idea because that would indicate to your customers how important you think it is. And then having signage in your customers Customers, you encourage them to. If you want to require that or not, totally up to. Okay, thanks. Natalie might have other thoughts. Yeah, just, you don't have to provide them. Um, it could get expensive and complicated to provide them to everyone. So I would say, it would just encourage your customers to bring your own. And if you're able to provide some for people who forget, that would be nice, um, but definitely not required. Um, and as for employees, the, the one kind of caveat about masks is that they can be uncomfortable, um, especially if it's hot, you're like breathing into them and you have this like kind of hot, wet thing on your face. And so one, it, especially in the middle of the summer, it actually like one concern is that it can predispose people to heat stroke on like really, really hot days. You don't have to worry about that until August, but mostly it's just that it can be uncomfortable. And so you're likely to be adjusting it and like itching your face. And that action is obviously like not touching your face is one of the things you're not supposed to do. And so if someone is like in the field alone, not at all around customers, you could probably relax that a little bit. But anytime you're around people, you should have a mask on. And also just keep in mind that it sends a message to customers. And so if someone's in the field not wearing a mask, who's clearly an employee, it kind of gives the impression that you're not actually that concerned about it. All right, thanks. Um, it sounded like Ryan needs to go, right? Yeah, yeah, I gotta get going here, but thank you everybody for everything. Thanks for all the questions and all the answers and we'll get through this one way or another. Yep, thanks a thank lot. You, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. We still have 40 people here. So do people have other questions um, or suggestions? Uh, feel free to enter them in the, the chat box. Somebody asked, are you going to raise prices because of all this extra stuff that you're having to do? Um, so if there are any growers here who um, want to chime in on that, I would, I personally, I wouldn't do that myself um, because I feel like this is hard on the customers too, right? <laughs> so I personally would not. As somebody who, um, who grew up on a, a vineyard and my family owns a winery, I really don't see them increasing prices because of what's happening. Somebody said, I think that we will have to raise our prices a bit, but as little as possible. So um, Greg said, I might have missed this. Don't forget the plastic shield at checkout. Um, that is something that we mentioned where having like a sneeze guard in place does provide a barrier um, for droplets. And so it, it is a good idea to have that, but it's not required. Um, but just keep in mind that even if you have that there, you still want to make sure you're practicing like proper physical distancing where you have six feet between you and the customer. Um, and just sometimes when we have things like that in place, like when we're wearing a mask or when we have a sneeze guard, we, we kind of, even if we're not trying to, we think like, oh, we're protected because this is here. So therefore I can relax on other things. Um, so just make sure that if you are using one of those sneeze guards, which is a good thing to do, that you're not, um, forgetting to do the other things as well. It looks like the questions have started to wind down. Um, a few comments. Someone put up a plastic sheet. Uh, someone says, oh, we might have people check out using a face shield. Or sorry, we might have our checkout people use a face shield. Yeah, I also saw um, at 
Untied's uh, vegetable farm, their stands that they have throughout the West Metro, uh, a couple of their employees were wearing plastic shields as well. Um, so that's something that at least somebody in Minnesota is already trying. I see that we're trying to get customers to not linger, which goes against what has been stressed years before, so that customers would spend more money at your place. Yep, um, if anybody else has a comment on that. Yeah, I, I know it's tough. Um, we're definitely in unprecedented circumstances where we're having to do things that don't necessarily, um, you know, they're not necessarily the best for a business um, and that we've never really had to consider before. So I totally sympathize with that. Hey Annie, I, I'll just make a quick comment on the, the question of the shield. I think somebody was talking about like a plastic sheet going down in between, or maybe they were talking about the actual shield. But so the idea that some people are having is if you're out in the field and it's hot and you don't want a piece of cloth over your mouth, understandable. So maybe the next best would be a plastic shield like you might see a surgeon wear. It, st uh, it starts here on your head and it goes down below your chin. It wraps around your face and it's just a, a clear plastic shield. And the research shows they are a, an alternative that is acceptable. They, they don't, they're not as tight around your mouth so some particles might slip down more easily. So you have to weigh that, but it's better than nothing. And especially if you're going to be messing with your mouth a lot with your face because of the mask is uncomfortable, or if you have asthma or COPD or something where you can't wear a mask, the shield might be a really good alternative. Also allows you to see someone's face better. So for somebody dealing with your customers, it might be a good uh, option. All right. Would it be reasonable to tell customers you'll be rounding cash transactions up to the next dollar so we don't have to deal with coin change? Natalie's giving a thumbs up. Honestly, I think that if I were a customer, I might feel better about that. Because like, keep in mind that they're also wanting to reduce their own risk. Um, so I, don't, I guess I don't see any problem with it. Yeah. And if you have an option of credit card or cash, then you can say, you know, if you're paying with credit card, then uh, you're just paying the per pound charge. But if you're using cash, then we have to round up. Um, a suggestion, we're hoping to put up shields with plastic wrap on cute wooden barn window frames at the checkout. Um, somebody suggested, you know, we're talking about rounding up, but you could also consider rounding down for cash. All right, this looks like a question. Um, let's say I ask people to pay with a check. They write it and show me the amount and put it in a box. How long do I have to wait to touch those checks? Should I leave them for a few days, touch them with gloves, spray them with disinfectant, etc.? I wouldn't say the thing because it, it will make the check unreadable, but you put them in a box. And if you normally would deposit them that night, I think you're fine. Just wash your hands after you handle them. It's like your groceries coming in. It's really like anything. Just wash your hands and handle them. You're fine. And you really don't need to take any special precautions with those. Great. That that question reminded me um, of something that some met, some farmers market vendors are doing where they have a cash box where you put your cash and then you have like clean cash that hasn't been touched by anyone in a few days so that you can give that back to them, but you're not having to take cash directly from them. Um, so that's just one other way to kind of minimize you having to touch something that might be containing potential virus particles. Um, a couple really good suggestions. The first one was about that um, rounding up for cash idea. Somebody said, I was thinking rounding up for cash would encourage people to use credit cards or other electronic means while rounding down would encourage more cash use. Which is probably true. Um, another suggestion, maybe use as far as keeping people distance at the checkout, maybe use cheap marking flags for group dis for group distancing outside of the barn, like while they're waiting, um, similar to marks or X's at grocery stores. Yep, it's a good idea. 
Definitely use something. If it's like an indoor surface, like put tape on the floor or stickers outside, flags are a great idea. Um, I've just noticed from watching people trying to stay six feet apart that we're really bad at doing it. <laughs> we're really bad at estimating what six feet look like. And often when we see lines of people, they're probably standing more like three or four feet apart. So the more that you can do to remind people with physical reminders of this is what six feet looks like, um, the better. Um, okay, so Annalisa needs to take off, uh, but if you see the slide that I have up, that lists our contact information. Um, so those who aren't familiar with our team, Annalisa is a food safety specialist. I focus on fruit crops and Natalie focuses on vegetable crops. Um, and then you can see Valerie's information on there as well. There is an email address for COVID specific questions. That's very handy. And then Ryan offered his contact information as well. Um, what else can we say? I just wanna encourage you know, um, communication ahead of time with customers, whether you have an email list, mailing list, um, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you use, if you can get on the news even. Um, to talk about your farm for the upcoming season. Um, because as we all know from social media, people have a lot of opinions about this. And, um, you know, I, I just want to use the example of the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, which is uh, run by University of Minnesota. Uh, they are closed right now except for car traffic and people have to have uh, specific times that they sign up to drive through. And some people are unhappy with this. And, um, you know, there can be some negative feedback to the policies that uh, that businesses are choosing to employ uh, because of this very difficult situation. And so I feel like just the more we can communicate with customers ahead of time, the, the more time they have to digest that before coming out to the farm. So communication beforehand, very important. All right, one more suggestion. I suggested rounding down for cash because of the extra charges for using credit cards. Interesting times. Yes, indeed. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, it's 537. So thank you everybody who stuck around for this Q&A. Um, we have, you know, tossed around the idea of maybe doing a discussion next week if people are interested in just doing a more formal Q&A. So I'm not sure if we've decided whether or not we are doing that. But um, yeah, our contact info is there. Feel free to contact us. And um, Annalisa, Natalie, thank you for staying on and helping answer these questions. And thank you to all the participants for the good engagement and great questions and ideas. You all have the ideas that we're happy to share. So if you do have specific questions or ideas that you think are worthy of passing on, that's our job. So let us know. All right, thank you. Thanks. That's everything. Yep. Bye. Thanks.